So I became very interested in this experiment when these Chinese physicists measured the weight of an electron versus a positron. The, the electrons um, basically are heavier than the positron. The positron loses weight. So if you take a negative electron and spin it positive, positive spin, it loses weight. So the, the spin, it, it, the spin basically causes the gravitational causes, interaction. Yeah, my, my theory is that what they haven't seen is it's the spin orientation. So if you, basically the way to drag electrons in a conductor is when you run a magnet over a conductor, you grab electrons and they start moving through the conductor, which is, could be a copper wire, a gold wire, silver wire, anything. And when electrons move through a conductor, they encounter resistance to their flow because they're bound in the material. They don't travel at the speed of light. Yeah. In copper, depending on the charge, according, according to what I researched recently, they'll travel... Um, Two thirds of the speed of light. When they're when they're if there's enough uh, magnetic field there, when you don't charge them, they travel very slowly. They drift around in the material when there's no charge. So the key is, in a craft, how do you get a lot of positive electrons to happen? When John Hutchison was beaming the cannonballs with radio waves, well, radio waves are electromagnetic waves. They're all positive, and he stepped them. He he did. Van de Graaff static, and then he did low frequency radio, medium frequency radio, and high frequency. So he's he's pyramiding them. The frequencies are getting higher and higher frequency in material. So a you know the, the apex of a pyramid is really high frequency, and the base is much lower mm, frequency. Okay. See? So John was really brilliant in in his inadvertent discovery of that. But what I realized was he had to beam his targets for hours sometimes before they went anti-gravitic. But the point is, he really was inducing a lot of positive uh, electrons, causing a lot of positive electrons, because he's using very, very concentrated uh, radio transmitters. So, what I became more interested in is, is how a UFO really works to get a, an actual craft to levitate versus trying to get a cannonball to levitate. And I was really astounded when I started looking at some footage I got from Phoenix, Arizona, from Jeff um, Willies, and he's using a old video cameras that used interlaced video frames like this. And so when you move the camera a lot, you get in the, the, the two frames deinterlace. You see the staggered effect here in the UF. Here's a UFO, May twenty fourth, two thousand and three. Okay, so this is this is more of a reverse engineering UFO. This is this is a, the last clue I was looking for. And you can see in this video frame right through the UFO. And you can see the sunlight glaring off of what looks like a coil inside of it. You see the dome and the, and the side here? Oh, okay, okay. And you see here, and, and you see the sunlight gleaming off of that? That's a cylinder. But notice the edges of the cylinder are concave a little bit. And I became extremely interested in why that was happening. So there's the UFO, normal frame. There it is in another frame where you can see right through it. And I'm like, oh my god, that's a freaking coil. And it's not copper coil. It might even be um, it might even be a bismuth coil. Bismuth wire is really hard to get. So what happens <coughs> when you have see a standard Tesla coil or transmitter coil is cylindrical, straight cylindrical. So the radio photons come off of it, it just straight out. But when a coil is concave, it, just like when you have a magnifying glass, it magnifies the radio photons and they become highly compressed at the magnification point here. You see that? Now, what does that mean? Well, you think of electromagnets, and these electro, the electromagnets, you just wrap copper wire around some steel, which has iron in it, and when you run current through there, you get a magnet. So, you see in these crop circles, you'll see uh, clockwise and counterclockwise <coughs> spirals fitting right inside of each other. Mm, They're okay. trying to tell us something. Clockwise and counterclockwise facing each other. Right. So this, I became very interested in what was inside. And I actually can see two coils, a smaller one and a wider one, inside of each other. And I believe what they're doing is, you know, they are basically sending 
a very compressed magnetic field to the to what is known as the rim of the UFO, the classical saucer-shaped UFO. And if you look at this photo from Billy Marsh from the 70s, and this is very similar to what I saw in Berkeley in 1968. They were Palladian, just like his. I saw mine just a few years before he saw his first one. And you see the, the, the two impressions on the bottom, the ring here and the ring here. I think those are the two coils that are inside of this thing. Oh, Just okay. like back here. I'll show you. You see, see this wider impression here? That's from the deinterlaced frames. You see there's a double impression? Because he's hand-holding the camera, the timing on the interlacing frames is off. So oh, I see what you mean. So you're yeah. getting a double image. So there's a, a skinnier coil inside of a, a wider coil. That's what I believe is there. And so this, see, skinnier coil, wider coil. So they're creating the field, sending it out to the rim of the craft, and then that's, that's taking the electrons. There's something that happens on the rim. I know what it is, and that's the part that I'm not going to tell anybody, but basically, at the rim here, you see there's the two coil impressions, inside of here is a track. And the key here is when you compress magnetic fields like that here, the, the, the magnetic field is so, so compressed, so concentrated, if you can spin enough electrons clockwise versus counterclockwise, you should have anti-gravity. So Hutchinson tells me about this guy named Podolinov, and Podolinov spun magnets on an armature, a crankshaft motor, and when he got to 6,000 RPMs, clockwise, they got weight loss, significant mm. weight loss. But counterclockwise, they gained weight. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because when a magnet spins in a conductor, it's going to grab the electrons to go in the direction of spin. So counterclockwise, which is the direction an electron spin naturally, is in a negative charge, is going to bind everything to gravity. So of course it's going to weigh more. Clockwise, you're starting to go in the direction that radio waves um, spin in and light, and you're going to free yourself from gravity. The key is the materials you use. Certain materials produce more positive electrons than others. So in, in Pogdanov's case then, spinning it move those electrons with it out to the rim, just like with the Pleiadian craft mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and, and everything happened at the rim of the craft. Yeah, because that's the point where the magnification is. You got, you got a three-dimensional, see, I could take a lens or a concave electromagnet, right? Just two-dimensionally, and I, my electromagnet sends my magnetic field to here. But with a cylinder, it's three-dimensionally here. It's everywhere on the rim of the UFO you have a compressed field of, of, of uh, electromagnetic field. What you do with that compressed magnetic field is what I've never told anybody. There's a few people who could figure it out, but that is the key. That is the key to anti-gravity. Hmm. Okay. And that what it is, is I'll tell you a little bit, because you'll see this in my wand, this wand here, is can you spin magnets free of an armature? Because when magnets, you need to get past 20,000 RPMs. I mean, Pogonov got weight loss at 6,000 RPMs. But 20,000 RPMs is the limit of the human ear. That's the frequency of the human ear, 20,000 hertz, right? Which is a very interesting number. If you look at cymatic experiments online, when they start beaming the gooey substance that they beam the, the uh, um, frequencies with, the sound frequencies, as soon as they get to 20,000 hertz, it starts to coil upwards above the ground. Oh, okay. See? Gooey, heavy material. And you'll notice the coiling goes clockwise. In the John Searle motor, notice that all of his experiments online, he spins the magnets counterclockwise. He doesn't want you to know the secret is... See, he's, he's right. His magnets don't have an armature. And when, when, you're, when you don't have an armature, you don't have any heat. Because you've got nothing grinding against ball bearings. And then the magnets can spin way past 2,000 RPMs, 20,000 RPMs, oh, okay. 50,000 RPMs. And when they get that fast, they start grabbing electrons in the material. But the materials have to be right or it won't work. Now the idea, what we were talking about before, is can you get a 
magnet to spin free of an armature at super high RPMs in the UFO, so you can drag all your electrons in a positive direction. This is not even 20 watts transmitting through that. So you're saying that spin like this might be a little bit similar to what's happening in the Searle effect. Yeah, see, this is a cylindrical coil. If you have a concave coil, you're going to trap your magnet in the magnetic field and drag it in the loop out here super fast. Depending on the curvature here, you just, you know, find your compression point on your waves. And these things get really aggressive when you turn the power up. That's only uh, 30 watts here. This is a 30 watt RMS amp. See, it's all about numbers and timing. Like I said, there's a part of it no one can figure it out unless they know how to do the math. You could never just, you know, power a concave coil and get a magnet to spin. It's all about the signals that go in there. Oh, and you know, Searle was talking about that as well. It's the law of squares. What Searle has is he has, he has his electromagnets in a circuit. His electromagnets in a circuit. He has those stations with the concave bars, you know, the, and then those are, those are sending signals that are causing the magnet to spin. If you don't know the right numbers to put in the signal, you won't get the magnet to spin very fast. Searle puts the numbers in the magnets, the solid magnet. Mm, okay. See, Searle programs this with a particular number of Gauss, magnetic field strength. And then this one is a different number, and this one's a different number. That's what he's doing with his magnets. But you can do that with a signal, too. Yeah, I, I understand that Searle may have, have striped his magnets to create almost like gears. Maybe that, that creates some... Yeah, he put, he put uh, different numbers. I talked to his people. He put different Gauss field strengths in the magnet. So they would have difference. Oh, okay. And because of the differential, he could create a sine wave between one magnet and another. And once he sets up a permanent sine wave, they will move along with the sine wave. Ah, I see what you mean. They follow the field. Permanent power motor.